Uh, well, friends, uh, last year I got to climb uh, a lighthouse. Uh, I was on holidays in Port Stephens with my family, and uh, we went up to this lighthouse uh, that was there. Uh, you might know the one that I'm talking about. And uh, when we got to the top, the old man who worked uh, in the lighthouse uh, began to tell us about all the ships out in the harbour that had been shipwrecked before they uh, built this lighthouse. Uh, you see, before the lighthouse was built, there were all these ships that were destroyed and people uh, lost their lives because, well, they couldn't actually see what was up ahead of them. Uh, if only they had known that there were rocks up ahead, well, they would have been able to turn around and avoid disaster. Now, I think this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to make choices or decisions in life, don't you think? We simply do not know what lies ahead. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. I mean, we think that there are big choices that we need to make in life, and uh, I'm sure uh, we all spend hours agonising over these choices. Uh, I'm thinking of choices like you know, where to work, uh, or who to marry, or where to live, uh, those kind of big choices that we need to make in life. However, sometimes it can be the smallest choices that we make, almost unthinkingly, that end up being the most significant decisions in our lives. For example, uh, I get up in the morning, and uh, I make the choice to ride my bike to work, rather than take the car or public transport. As soon as I go out the door and start riding, I get hit by a car and I spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair. If only I could could have seen what was ahead of me, well, perhaps I should have chosen differently. Uh, What are the choices that uh, you and I are faced with at the moment? What are those big decisions that we are faced with at the moment? How do we know which are the big choices and which are the relatively insignificant choices? Uh, Well, we've been working our way through the book of Isaiah for a couple of months now, and uh, today we're going to look at chapters 34 to 35, uh, which is part of a larger unit that goes all the way from chapter 28 uh, to chapter 35. Uh, If you cast your minds back a bit, uh, you might remember that the earlier chapters of Isaiah uh, were really all about Jerusalem, uh, but Jerusalem under the reign of King Ahaz, uh, who was the king at the time. But this new unit that that we're looking at today takes us into the reign of Ahaz's son, uh, who was called King Hezekiah. Now, uh, unfortunately, we won't have time to look at uh, all these chapters in detail, uh, but I just want you to see uh, that the whole unit uh, from chapter 28 uh, all the way to chapter 35 moves from crisis to hope. Uh, If you just flick through your Bibles and have a look at uh, chapters 28 to 35, uh, you'll see that it moves from crisis to hope. Uh, Chapter 28, crisis. Uh, Isaiah says that the northern kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim, will be destroyed by the Assyrian army. Remember, Isaiah is writing to Jerusalem in the south, but he says that the northern uh, kingdom will be destroyed by the Assyrian army. Chapter 29, crisis. Uh, Isaiah says that the Assyrians, uh, after they've demolished the, the north, will come down south and lay siege to the city of Jerusalem herself. Uh, In chapters 30 to 31, uh, crisis. Uh, In these chapters, we see Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, making the same mistake as his father in putting his trust in foreign nations rather than in God for protection. Uh, This time, he turns to Egypt rather than trusting in God. But in chapter 32 you'll notice that there is the beginning of hope. Isaiah speaks about a new king who will reign in righteousness. 
and chapter 33, hope again. We see a faithful prayer of dependence by some who were in Jerusalem. Uh, And I want to suggest that uh, as we come to chapters 34 and 35, well, this also is a word of hope. Only this word of hope operates a bit like a lighthouse. These chapters tell us what is coming up ahead of us. It looks ahead to the end of the world and tells us what is in store. Uh, If you have a look at uh, chapter 34, verse 4 in your Bibles, chapter 34, verse 4, uh, you'll notice that it speaks there about the host of heaven uh, or the stars and planets, in other words, rotting away and the skies rolling up like a scroll. In other words, this is talking about the final chapter in world history. This is what will happen when God brings this world to an end. And so what is going to happen at the end of the world? Well, uh, you can see there that God is going to judge the nations. He's going to bring his judgment on the nations. Uh, In verse 1, you can see there that he summons the nations to come and hear about this judgment. And uh, as we read these these verses, I want you to uh, notice in particular the rage and the fury of God in these verses. Uh, Have a look at verse 1. Draw near, O nations, to hear, and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their host. He has devoted them to destruction. He has given them over for slaughter. But friends, who in particular will fall under the judgment of God. Well, uh, you'll notice there that Isaiah keeps on referring to the people of Edom. Uh, You see it there in verse 5 where uh, it mentions judgment upon Edom. Uh, You see it again at the end of verse 6 where it speaks about a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Uh, You see it again in verse 9 where the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch. Uh, That's not a rhetorical question. Uh, Why don't you uh, turn to the person sitting next to you and uh, have a think about why you think uh, Edom in particular uh, is mentioned here. I wonder whether you can just have a quick chat with your neighbour about that. Uh, Okay, that's enough time. Uh, Does anyone want to hazard a guess uh, as to why Isaiah uh, picks on Edom here rather than the other nations? There was a lot of talk uh, a minute ago. (laughs) Why is Edom in particular uh, mentioned by Isaiah, do you think? Does anyone know who the Edomites were, by any chance? Yeah, Shan Shan. Yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. So um, if you remember back in Genesis, um, uh, Isaac uh, has two children, uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, and uh, we're told that God chooses Jacob uh, and not Esau. And so even from the womb, uh, these two brothers are at enmity with one another. And uh, as you see the history of of Israel unfolding, uh, it's the descendants of Esau, uh, that is the the people of Edom, uh, who are constantly opposed to Israel and to God's purposes. Uh, They are, if you like, Uh, the quintessential enemy of Israel and uh, God's purposes. And uh, I think that uh, Edom is particularly mentioned here because she is meant to symbolize anyone in this world who lives in opposition to God and his will. However, uh, what is striking in chapter 34, I think, is the nature of this judgment. The nature of this judgment. For did you notice that the judgment of Edom is described as a sacrifice? Uh, In our passage this morning, uh, you see this horrifying picture of God taking his huge sword and sacrificing the people of Edom with it. 
Now you can see it there in verse 5. Have a look with me at verse 5. For my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. Behold, it descends for judgment upon Edom, upon the people I have devoted to destruction. The Lord has a sword. It is sated with blood. It is gorged with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Bozrah, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen shall fall with them, and young steers with the mighty bulls. Their land shall drink its fill of blood, and their soil shall be gorged with fat. Uh, You may have noticed the phrase, uh, devoted to destruction, uh, repeated a few times uh, in chapter 34. Uh, It's a phrase used to describe what conquering kings in the ancient world did to their enemies when they took over their land. Uh, You know, when a king conquered another nation, he would take control of the land and he would devote everyone in that land to destruction so as to eliminate any enemies. It was his way of asserting his kingship and rule and saying that there are no challenges. Uh, What God is saying here is that one day he will assert his rule in this world and he will destroy all those who oppose him and his ways. They will be sacrificed. They will be slaughtered. Uh, Now, friends, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I must admit, uh, I find passages like this uh, very difficult to read. Uh, Is that true for you as well? Uh, It's one of those passages that is very graphic and unpleasant, and uh, not the kind of passages that we, you know, uh, text to each other for comfort and things like that. Uh, I think one of the things I find very difficult about passages like this is just the sheer severity of the anger and wrath of God. Uh, Perhaps you might find yourself asking how anybody's sin can deserve this kind of carnage and slaughter. But friends, uh, one thing uh, we need to keep in mind is that the severity of any crime is actually measured uh, not by the person committing the crime, but it's measured by the one uh, by whom uh, uh, the one against whom the crime is committed. Uh, let me illustrate what I mean. Uh, some of you might have heard this illustration before, but suppose you have a student who punches another student in class. Uh, what happens? Uh, well, the student will likely get a detention. Uh, Suppose during this detention, the same student then punches the teacher. Uh, What happens then? Well, he's likely to be expelled. Uh, Suppose on the way home, after being expelled, the student decides to punch a policeman on the nose. What happens? Well, he's likely to end up in jail. Uh, Suppose some years later, the very same boy is in a crowd waiting to see the President of the United States. He lunges forward to punch him. What happens? Well, he'll be shot dead on the spot by the Secret Service. You see, friends, what God is saying here is that he is the king of and ruler and master of this world, and he will not be challenged. One day, because of who he is, he will destroy in his anger anyone who stands opposed to him and his ways. Now, I think the language of this chapter is meant to shock us into seeing just how serious sin and opposition to God really is. What are the ways in which you and I uh, oppose God in our lives? What are the the ways in which we ignore him and want to go against what we know him to be saying? 
Well, uh, in the rest of chapter 34, uh, you see this awful picture of God turning the land of Edom into what is effectively a desert or a wasteland. Uh, In verse 9, you can see there that the streams of Edom uh, are turned to pitch or tar. In verse 13, you see thorns and thistles uh, coming out of the ground and overcoming the land so that the only things that can inhabit this land are wild animals like jackals and hyenas and wild goats. In other words, when God's judgment falls, the land will no longer be a place of blessing. It will rather be a place of curse. And in verse 16, God says that these things are certain to happen because he has commanded them to happen. They have been written down in the book of the Lord. They have been written down in scripture and his spirit is at work to bring about the things that he has spoken of. Uh, Now, that's a a pretty grim chapter, isn't it? Uh, But I think Isaiah writes uh, chapter 34 so that he can deliberately contrast the judgment of God in chapter 34 with the wonderful salvation of God that you see in chapter 35. Uh, It's a bit like a a diamond on on a black velvet pouch. The blackness of judgment only serves to highlight the brilliance of God's salvation even more. And so uh, what do we see in chapter 35? Uh, Chapter 35, well, the first thing that you'll notice is that God's salvation involves the transformation of this world into a wonderful garden. What was once destroyed by God and made into a desert is now transformed by God into this beautiful luscious green garden. Uh, You can see it there in uh, verse 1 of chapter 35. Verse 1 of chapter 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of of our God. Uh, now, friends, I, I don't know anything about uh, gardening, uh, but I'm told that a crocus is a flower in the iris family. Um, that may mean something to you. Uh, Lebanon was a place known for its rich cedar trees. Carmel and Sharon, uh, we, we have a Sharon here, uh, were places to the north of Israel who were particularly which was particularly fertile and green. And so the picture here is of God transforming the world into this luscious garden paradise, which is full of God's blessing. And those who live in this place will see the glory and the majesty of God himself in all his goodness. And further, did you notice that this garden will be a place where the broken people will be made whole. In verse 5, the blind will see and the deaf hear. In verse 6, the lame man will leap like a deer and the mute will sing for joy. In verses 6 to 7, it will be a place where will be streams and pools and springs of water giving life. To it will be a completely new place where sin and sickness and suffering and the things that ravage this world will be no more because God will be there and he will satisfy the thirsts of our hearts in a way that nothing in this world will satisfy. Can you see what he's talking about? What a wonderful place this will be. Why does Isaiah write this? Well, he writes this to give hope to the faithful people in Jerusalem. Uh, You can see it there in chapter 35.3. This is the hope that he speaks of. Uh, Strengthen the weak hands 
and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come to save you. I'm going to recycle a lot of illustrations this morning. Uh, Some of you might have heard this one about Florence Chadwick. Uh, She was an American marathon swimmer uh, who is perhaps best known for being the first woman to uh, swim the English Channel in both directions. However, as soon after this remarkable achievement, uh, she set another uh, challenge for herself, uh, and this time it was to swim uh, from a place off the coast of of America uh, all the way to the mainland in California. Uh, Now, what happened was that on her first attempt, uh, she started swimming and the fog, and after 15 hours of swimming, Chadwick was pulled from the water exhausted. Perhaps what was most heartbreaking was that later they discovered that when they pulled her out out of the water, she was only 800 metres from the mainland. Uh, At a news conference the next day, uh, Chadwick said, and I quote, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Two months later, she tried again, and this time the fog set in again, but she made it all the way to the Californian coastline. When asked about her success, uh, she said this time the difference was that she kept a mental image of the shoreline as she swam. You see, keeping the finish line in her thoughts made all the difference for her. It gave her hope to keep swimming. Uh, Friends, Isaiah writes chapter 35 in order to give hope to the faithful in Jerusalem by describing their eternal destination. God will save them and one day they will enjoy his presence forever in this new garden paradise. But friends, I just want to say that this is exactly the same hope that you and I have in the gospel if we are the people who belong to Jesus. If you remember in the Gospels, uh, there's there's a, a part where John the Baptist is uncertain about whether Jesus is the Messiah, whether he's the one that we're all looking for, and he sends his messengers to ask Jesus whether he is the one to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus replies in Luke chapter 7, verse 22, he says... Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. You see, in the first coming of Jesus, we have a foretaste of what the heavenly reality, this new garden paradise will be like. But when he comes back to, again, to judge the world, well, those who belong to him will taste this paradise forever. Friends, uh, is your faith a little bit shaky at the moment? Um, Is your heart anxious about what your future is? will be like. Well, if that describes you this morning and you belong to Jesus, God says to fix your eyes on him and the new garden paradise that he is bringing. He is mighty to save. He will bring you to a place of abundance and satisfaction and safety where the ravages of sin and death and suffering will be no more. And so the challenge of this part of God's word is, will you and I continue to trust him? Will you and I continue to live by faith and to obey him in our lives? Uh, Well, finally, how do we get to this garden paradise? How do we get there? 
Well, you can see towards the end of chapter 35 that Isaiah speaks of a highway. Now, you can see it there from verse 8 of chapter 35. Verse 8 of chapter 38, uh, 35. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk in the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Who are the ones who find themselves in this garden paradise? Well, it's the ones who cross the highway. Who are the ones who cross the highway? Well, in verse 8, it is those who are clean and holy and righteous before God. It is the same ones who are described in verse 9 as the redeemed and verse 10 as the ransomed. But friends, how is it that a sinful and unclean person like me and you who has opposed God time and time again in my life, how is it that we can become clean? Well, the astonishing news of the Bible is that in God's great kindness, he sent his only son into the world to die on the cross for your sins and my sins. He took my uncleanness upon himself And as he died on the cross in my place, he gave me his righteousness so that I can now be clean. He has redeemed or purchased me back for himself. And by his blood, he has paid a ransom price to set me free from the guilt and power and penalty of sin. Such that I can now have the hope of everlasting life and everlasting joy in the new garden paradise that he is bringing. What a wonderful saviour we have, friends. Let me finish up. Uh, What we've seen this morning is God showing us uh, what lies ahead at the end of the world. Those who oppose God in their lives will be devoted to destruction forever. Those who are cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus will find themselves on a highway to a garden paradise. You see, this is God's great lighthouse passage. It tells us and it warns us of what is up ahead so that we might make the right choices. Uh, Now, it's very possible, isn't it, in a crowd of this size, that there are some of us who are continuing to live in opposition to God. Uh, We may come to church from time to time, but in our lives we've never really put our whole trust in the Lord Jesus to wash us clean from our sins and to follow him wholeheartedly in our lives. We've been rejecting God and ignoring him and living in opposition to him. And if that is you, then the invitation here is to turn to Christ Jesus today before it is too late. He is your only hope of avoiding the wrath and anger of God that is sure to come. Jesus has died. He he has risen from the dead. He is now seated at God's right hand. And one day he will come to judge this world. And on that day, he will destroy those who are opposed to him. You have been warned, but there is great hope in Jesus. So turn to him before he is too late. For others of us, however, uh, we already put our trust in the death of Jesus for our cleansing and for our salvation. And we have begun to follow Jesus in our lives, uh, which is wonderful. 
Uh, but I, I just want to draw out two quick implications. Firstly, if we are the ones who have avoided God's wrath and anger, and we believe that one day, the day of God's judgment is coming, just as God has said, then what are we doing to warn others about that day? Uh, We have opportunities all the time, don't we, to pray for and to speak to those around us who do not know the Lord Jesus. But in particular, in the next two weeks leading up to Easter, uh, we're going to invite uh, and ask everyone at church uh, to help us to speak uh, speak about Jesus to the people who live around here. Uh, For the next two weeks, we're going to knock on some doors and uh, invite people along to various things uh, at our church uh, with the hope and the prayer that they will come and hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Uh, For some of us, uh, I know that that is a daunting uh, thing, and so we plan to uh, send people out in pairs. But uh, will you take up this opportunity? Uh, Who knows, God might use you to change the eternal destination of somebody, perhaps somebody that we don't even know yet in this area. But secondly, if you and I are the people who belong to, this, uh, to the Lord Jesus and to the garden paradise that he has promised, well, will we find our source of joy in Jesus Christ himself? Now, I know that this side of heaven, we will not feel the complete joy that we will have one day in the garden paradise. But surely when we come together as the people who belong to Jesus, and surely as we are come together and are reminded of all the great things that Christ has done for us, then we have every reason to lift our voices and sing with gladness, and with joy. And so will you sing with great gladness and joy this morning uh, as we sing songs together, uh, as we speak to one another? Uh, let's do that with gladness and joy in our hearts. I think uh, we're going to have an opportunity to put this into practice. Uh, I'm going to invite the musos up and uh, they're going to lead us in song.